This is Jonathan Lane from Fan Film Factor, and today I am here with Eric Henry, a person I've been wanting to interview for literally years, and also with Margaret Herpener, whom I've only just met. They are the showrunner and the producer and lead actor of the just-released Pacific 201, a fan film that has been in the making for, whoa, five years? Longer than that? Eric, how, how long have you been working on this thing? Well, I guess it's been a little longer than five years. We did our Kickstarter in September of 2015. So yeah, we're a little over five years now, but we weren't in constant production for that whole time because there was quite a long time where we weren't working during that uncertainty with the lawsuit between CBS and Axanar. And um, we weren't producing that whole time because we weren't sure what the future of fan films was. There were some breaks in there, but um, yeah, five years. The five-year mission. Now, it's only been a couple of months since First Frontier came out, and that's also a five-year mission. So you're sort of like the second of the long-awaited fan films to come out. And then next month, if all goes well, Yorktown, which has got to have the record because that's been in production for 35 years, is going to be coming out. But this is sort of a magical time for fan films, kind of you know clearing the queue, as it were. So, Eric, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about what you've been up to for the last five years. But before we get too far away, I'd like to ask Margaret to just sort of introduce herself. You are one of the actors who appears in Pacific 201, and you're also the producer. So can you tell us a little bit about what you have been doing in terms of getting Pacific 201 from there to here? Yeah, well, what I do other than acting is, as a producer, I helped build the set. I helped, you know, make sure that everything's on time and scheduled and props and makeup and that sort of thing. Now, what character do you play in Pacific 201? I play Elisa Vandre. Now, that's the one with the accent, right? That's right. And you don't have an accent. So that's, that, that accent's completely made up for the, uh, the fan film, huh? Well, that's right. Yeah. My family's Dutch, so I kind of picked up an accent from my cousin's. Oh, okay. Well, that's kind of cool. And you decided to do that accent when you created the character, or was the character created already, and then you decided, oh, I'll make her Dutch and give her the accent? Was that a decision you made or a decision that Eric made? What was that? <laughs> well, Eric has been trying, from the beginning, he was trying to get me involved in his film. And after the last film that I did with him, I said, nope, I'm not going to do any more films. And he was like, yeah, but I need a Dutch character. And I was like, oh, fine. <laughs> uh, so I did it, yeah. <laughs> and Eric, why did you want her to be Dutch? You know, you were obviously the person who wrote Pacific 201. What was it so important about Van Dre that Van Dre be Van Dre and, and Dutch? When I originally wrote the script, the character of Van Dre is something of a, an outsider to the rest of the cast. She's a newcomer. She's, I mean, we set this up in one of our teasers where um, she's being grilled by a talk show host. Where she's... I love that one, by the way. I, that is one of my favorite all-time fan films, the talk show host one. I can't remember the name of it, but I love that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that is official Star Trek headcanon for me. I love that little fan film. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks. So she's extremely, she's very young and people don't really super trust her. And I kind of wanted to reinforce that by having something of a language barrier. Of course, that doesn't really exist in Star Trek, but I thought by giving her a fairly heavy accent, we could kind of otherize her a little bit from the other crew members who speak like Americans. And it made sense to make it Dutch because uh, the actress who I wanted to cast for the part knew some Dutch and could do a Dutch accent very convincingly. You know, she has family who speak the language, and she's traveled to the country. And that's pretty much the whole story behind it. I wanted an accented character, but Dutch was kind of decided because of who I had access to. So it's a good thing that she said yes. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, Eric, let's go back in time to the origin, the secret origin, if we want to say that, of Pacific 201. So how did it go from not existing to being an idea in your head. I have a lot of fan film ideas, actually, and I'm not gonna spill them all, but one of my fan film ideas was I wanted to have like the ultimate homage to 
submarine films, essentially, which is the the general inspiration for a lot of Star Trek, especially early Star Trek. But I wanted to do I wanted to focus more on the rudimentary kind of going in blind feeling that a lot of these submarine films have where, you know, you don't have windows you don't have ways to immediately verify where you are and where the enemy is, for instance. And there's this overwhelming, constant sense of claustrophobia. You know, you're trapped on this ship and um, the spaces are narrow and the ceilings are low. And I really wanted to do a Star Trek fan film that felt that way, that wasn't the kind of huge office building or hotel feeling that Starfleet ships typically have, like... I wanted it to feel like a space vehicle where space was this you know, ultimate commodity and everything was cramped and things could easily go wrong. Like, you know, there's a very, very thin line between life and death and stuff like that. I didn't want space to feel comfortable and safe. And going off of that, I originally had written the script or very early treatments. I wasn't even at the script at that point. It was actually a pre-Archer fan film. My idea for it was the very first Earth ship that had a saucer shape. It would be an extremely primitive ship that could only do like, I don't know, like warp, less than warp two or something like that. I forget exactly what the chronology is for the warp development as per Star Trek Enterprise. But it was going to be like a fairly standard Starfleet mission kind of adventure, but it w- we would be extremely limited by the technology. And it's kind of what I wanted Enterprise to be. But Enterprise ended up kind of giving the crew all the same tools that later Star Treks have. They just name them differently. You know, they've got essentially phasers and they polarize the hull. But we're basically using the same narrative uh, storytelling device that shields serve, you know, stuff like that. They have torpedoes. I wanted them to literally have, you know, they've got a few atomic missiles on board. There's no phasers. There's no... They have no defensive systems. It's an extremely rickety ship, that kind of thing. When I thought about it, I realized I couldn't really tell the sorts of story I wanted to tell because at that point, mankind is kind of completely outclassed by all the other species around it who I couldn't meet any exotic new alien species. I couldn't do a lot of kind of groundbreaking political developments because those just don't happen. And we know they don't happen before, you know, you could do like the Kazinti stuff and stuff like that, but like, eh, I didn't want to do something so contrived. So I migrated the same concept of like the rickety claustrophobic ship, but I put it between Star Trek Enterprise and the original series, which gave me a lot more flexibility with the kind of political landscape that I wanted to play with. And I could still justify why the ship might feel as primitive as it does. Well, that's cool. Now, I have to say that I'm glad you decided to go in that direction because, for me, I love stories about what I like to call the gap time. And the gap time used to be somewhere between the Romulan War, you know, as Kirk had said in Balance of Terror, which was 100 years ago, and Star Trek. But... You know, we got a little bit of that. We got Enterprise, which gave us a bit of the Romulan War, but not enough of it. And, and thank you to Mark Nacarado for making the Romulan War fan film, which uh, also just uh, appeared recently. That was three years in development, so that's another one of those long-awaited ones. But yeah, so, you know, there's still that amazing hundred-year gap time, you know, and I'm, one of the reasons I liked Axanar so much, and you worked on Axanar, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, the prelude to Axanar so much is it filled in a little bit of that gap time. And then yours was 40 years after Enterprise, which would be like, you know, 40 or 50 years before Prelude to Axanar. So you were like dead center. And I just, I love the idea that you came up with of here is a sort of PTSD Earth culture, even Federation culture of, okay, we went out there and we explored and we got our asses kicked you know, space is is cold and death and all this sort of stuff, and we don't want to go out there anymore. And that after 40 years, you kind of forget. We've moved on. 9-11 obviously affected all of our lives, but 20 years later, a lot of us have moved on. There are people who've been born since it happened. The same thing with the attack on Pearl Harbor. You know, Japan became our ally eventually. 
you know, after World War II, he eventually became an ally of the Germans. You know, you move past these traumatic moments. And to see the Federation moving past those traumatic moments, it was a beautiful thing. That's why one of the reasons I loved Margaret's little vignette was here was somebody going against that fear to actually have the courage to reach out into space. Risk. Risk is our business. That's where it came from. And it's risky out in space. So I am a big fan of just the idea that you had. And just to let people know, I have not seen your full fan film yet. We're recording this before the premiere. We're a couple of days before it. Uh, all I've seen is like a little two-minute clip, which was great. I love the music. I know the overall plot line of it. But honestly, I haven't really seen the rest of it, so I'm really looking forward to it. But by this point, hopefully the rest of you have all seen it, so you're going to know stuff that I don't by the time you listen to this interview. Anyway, so you wrote this script back when? When was the point where you actually finished the script? The script was pretty much done right away. I wouldn't say finalized, but it was at a point where we knew what the whole story was pretty early on, but it was a huge, long process of refining the script. That was something I kind of really wanted to do with this project because I've done other film projects that I don't even really want to go into because I'm not, they're, they're not even remotely close to the quality of Pacific 201. But I felt one of my major weaknesses was that I didn't give the correct amount of time to refine and perfect the script. So with this project, we kind of spent like a year finalizing the script where we had the story, we had all the characters, but we kept refining and refining and refining and finding, you know, the core of the story, finding the core of the character interactions. The unfortunate part of that was during that time, the CBS fan film guidelines came out and here we had this, like hour long script. And now we're hearing that we have to cut it in half essentially. And we did get some people saying like, well, you know, you're going to be grandfathered in because you were producing before. And it's like, yeah, but we haven't shot yet. And it didn't feel right to me that, you know, if we had already shot the film, that's different. I wouldn't delete half of our footage, but words on a page aren't the same. And I thought, okay, I'm going to comply with the guidelines, but now I have to rewrite the script as a 30-minute story instead of an hour story, which was kind of a blessing and a curse, I think, because in some ways, it kind of forced me to, again, reconsider, okay, what is the core essence of this story? And I could fairly effectively pare it down to that 30 minutes without losing much, and since we had already worked so hard on fleshing out the world and fleshing out the characters, that I really feel that the 30-minute script implies this much larger world and this much larger ecosystem of the Pacific 201 universe without having to show it on screen because we injected that into this shorter script. So it's a really, really dense movie despite being as short as it is because we we spent just so much time developing it yeah and i have to say you know a half an hour isn't really that short i mean i know it you know feels short when you know your typical star trek episode was 48 minutes long but i always like to say that you know the twilight zone before they went to the hour format which got very very boring the twilight zone told some of the best stories in at that point i think it was like 24 minutes so we have even longer than that to tell our stories and I, I told you this, Eric, probably, a, well, at least a year ago, probably more, and I've been telling you ever since that, you know, you don't have to keep it to exactly 30 minutes. You know, if you were like 33 or even 36, even 38, you know, made up of like two 19-minute episode parts or whatever, I really don't think that's going to get you into too much trouble. Did you ever heed me on that, or is are you like literally at like 30 minutes exactly. We are not at literally 30 minutes exactly. It is pushing 38 minutes, I think. Oh, good. Maybe a little less because I'm actually going to do some cuts um, before release, but it'll be around 38 minutes. Maybe with credits, it'll be around 38 minutes. Yeah, and frankly, I don't think CBS is going to have a huge problem with well, that. Well, in my a... mind, I feel like an attitude of compliance is more important than literal letter of the law. We're clearly making an effort to satisfy 
the fan film guidelines. And from the very beginning, even before the guidelines came out, we were making an effort to not usurp the Star Trek branding. Pacific 201 was never Star Trek Pacific 201. It was always Pacific 201 with the intention that we were making obviously a Star Trek movie, but we didn't want it to feel like, well, this could really be a real Star Trek thing. We're making our own thing that respects Star Trek canon, but we never use their branding. We don't use their logos. I mean, except for the in-universe stuff. So I think that, you know, anybody from CBS who looks at our project close enough should see that, like, we're clearly not trying to step on any toes with official Star Trek. And I feel like, okay, so our runtime is a little long, but we've made this huge effort to be compliant. And I feel like that hopefully goes a long way. Yeah, you're totally not the droids they're looking for. So (laughs) there's fan films out there that are much more derivative of Star Trek, you know, directly. The stuff that's, you know, filmed on the TOS sets that exist in Ticonderoga and Georgia and now also in Arkansas. Those things look very much like Star Trek and Intrepid. They have 24th century uniforms there. And, you know, there's just so many fan films out there that are much more Star Trek than an era that never really was seen yet, you know, that 40 years after Enterprise. So personally, I think you're okay. Now, that being said, I don't work for CBS, uh, but <laughs> I think you'll be okay. Anyway, that all being said, let's shift back to Margaret, who's obviously been waiting patiently for her turn to talk again. When did you get involved with this project, Margaret? Was the script just written hot off the presses, or did Eric pull you in a little bit later? Um, I think he pulled me in a bit later. I believe he had started working on it a little bit before I graduated from college. So he pulled me in after I came out. Now, are you an actor, actress, I guess actor is the more politically correct term now. Are you an actor trained or are you just a fan who is good at what you do? Yeah, so I'm not an actor. I wasn't trained as an actor, but, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer this question. I'm not, I'm not specifically a Star Trek fan. And I think Eric was interested in making sure that the actors were, I guess he considers me a good actor, which is why he asked me to do it. But he thought it more important to have people that were good at acting rather than fans so that they would respect the story. And I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to say that. But. Yeah, I guess I could fill in there. I mean, I've worked with Margaret on other dramatic projects And, you know, she obviously doesn't have actual legitimate acting training, but she is quite good at acting, I believe, and very introspective and can really get to the core of the character and the story. And those were extremely valuable traits to me. And yeah, it's true that um, I was seeking out people that were not knowledgeable about Star Trek or Star Trek fans at all, because I didn't want that to corrupt the... The, the line delivery, I didn't want it to seep into the way that the actors carried themselves. Because Star Trek does have a very, it has a feel to it. And I feel like it's easy to slip into imitating Star Trek characters. And I wanted actors who literally were physically incapable of doing that because they hadn't watched Star Trek. And Margaret filled all the criteria of you know, good acting talent, you know, being kind of an outsider to the Star Trek fandom. I think it allowed me to bring more to Vandre's character. So instead of thinking of Vandre as like, oh, in the Star Trek universe, I'm this person, I can think about, I am this person. How will I behave? And not looking outside myself for that, but really thinking about, okay, if I were in this situation, how would I behave? Well, then let me ask you a question, because you're talking very much like an actor, and you say that you haven't been trained as an actor, and you did a really good job at this. Is it just that you missed your calling, or, <laughs> or you know, did you study a little bit about how to do this? Did you talk to actors, or did you just sort of say, let me do this the way I think it'll be best, and you just happened to hit the jackpot? Um, yeah, I think 
what you said is correct. I think about what makes sense to me. I guess I have, like Eric said, always been rather an introspective person and I can kind of imagine what being different people would be like, I guess, kind of sympathetic maybe. So yeah, I, I think being kind of maybe a little bit introverted helps me because I watch people a lot. And so I can kind of imagine what it would be like to be them. That's pretty cool. Because, you know, I, I have to say, not only, you know, did you appear in this, but my understanding, once again, I haven't seen the whole thing yet, is you were you had a meaty part in this. You know, you you were pretty prominent, you know, in terms of having a lot of lines and a lot of scenes. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say there are four main actors. There's the captain and there's a science officer and an engineer who are all kind of big characters. Um, and the engineer, Crewman Lawrence, is actually a trained actor. He's quite good. And then we found the captain at a comedy club. We went, <laughs> we went around looking for actors. It was really hard to find people that really fit what we were looking for. But we found him at a comedy club. And then... Um, you found him at a comedy club. I, I actually want to hear this story. So <laughs> you were sitting there at a comedy club. He finished his set. And then you went up to him and said, you want to be in my Star Trek fan film? I mean, how, how did this happen? <laughs> well, this is generally how it works. Eric pokes me and says, I, I like that guy. I want him. Go, go up and talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> so then I talk to him and try to convince him to um, donate his time to our film. And uh, everyone has been so gracious. It's been a crew of like 40 people. And we've been working on this for, you know, quite a few years, quite actively. And people have been really great. So, yeah, it's it's been great with all these actors who, you know, are always willing to come back for filming again and for extra stuff and sound and ADR. So it's, it's been great. So you went up to, I just, I, I really want to hear the story. So you went up to him after his set, introduced yourself and said, we're making a Star Trek movie here in, uh, and, and you're in where you're in Pennsylvania somewhere, right? Yes, that's right. And where is it like Harrisburg somewhere around there? Yes. Oh, okay. So, I mean, this is a small comedy club in Harrisburg. We're not talking about Las Vegas or Los Angeles or something like that. You know, I'm guessing this guy may, you know, actually have a day job <laughs> unless he's making his career out of stand-up comedy. And you say, what do you say? I mean, do you say we're making a Star Trek fan film? Do you want to be in it? How, how did that go? I really just want to know. Uh, well, generally, it's good to compliment people first. So I told him how, you know, wonderful he was. And we thought he looked perfect for the part. And he totally did. And uh, I think he made the perfect captain. So, yeah, I just complimented him and then told him that we had a really exciting opportunity. And he was perfect. And he thought it was a good idea. I mean, did he have any concept what a Star Trek fan film was, or did you have to explain that to him? Because most people don't know. I'm not sure. I think he had watched some Star Trek, but we kind of said, hey, you know, it's a short film. And so he got on board pretty quickly. I think we auditioned him. Yeah, we did. We did audition him. Yeah, I'll pop in, because um, that's kind of where I took over. It, yeah, it's, I mean, kind of going back to her story about me kind of sending her out to get him. I want to put my side of the story there because <laughs> we would go out a lot together to, for casting purposes, to scout local talent because I value her insight on these sorts of things. And when I saw who would become Captain Demir, his name is Casey Troyer, I think I had to convince Margaret actually that he was a good fit for the captain. But what struck me was how very close he was to sketches I had done of the character I'm like, he's got exactly the same jaw and nose as what I imagined the character to look like. Yeah, because you're an artist, actually. I've seen your work. You, yeah, you I design, I draw. I'm not quite as good an illustrator as I am a 3D modeler, but I do those things. And I, I had done character concept art for Pacific 201 just to know, you know, what kinds of people I was looking for. I wasn't dead set on that, but... When I saw him and he looked like exactly like my drawing, not not exactly, but really close, I'm like, we got to get that guy. And what I like to do with these things is Margaret is much more diplomatic. She's much more persuasive. And I'm also, I tend to have a threatening effect on people being as big and tall as I am and wild hair and beard and that kind of stuff. And I don't like to scare people. <laughs> um <laughs> So Margaret tends to be, she's a very good diplomat 
and she knows what's up. She knows what the project is. She knows what we're looking for. So usually I'll try to convince her to make the introductions and then bring him over. Then we talk. So she had already talked with him before she brought me over and we talked to him and I I think we auditioned him. We didn't immediately hire him on the spot because I had in mind that we might try to rigorously audition for characters, but it was actually quite difficult to find actors. The area is not very densely populated and it's, it's casting is hard. So we did audition him and we had him read lines. And after that audition, we kind of quote hired him on the spot, but um, no regrets there. He's an excellent captain. Did he have any acting training by the way? Yeah. I think he has, improv training, which is a little different than traditional acting. And he did do some improv on set, which always brought this really kind of genuine edge to the character where he's kind of like the father of the crew. And he would bring out like some fatherly improv at times. And it's like, wow, that's perfect. That's not even how I wrote the line, but he elevated the character from the script. Well, that's really cool. Okay. Are there any other of the actors that you want to give a particular shout out to just, you know, in terms of how they were hired or how they did? Most of the hiring process was actually fairly inner circle kind of stuff. I've done acting personally. I've done local theater. I was in shows in high school and that sort of thing. And I know people who act because the circles I have run historically. So for instance, our character crewman Lawrence He's somebody that I already knew. Our science officer, Lucy Rader, somebody I already knew. But we did have to do some more general auditions where we went out and put out ads or we went to the the local comedy club and stuff like that because that's like the acting place in the area. Uh, And you find, you know, people who are kind of general drama people that don't just focus on improv comedy and that kind of stuff. There's no like epic story of like, oh, here's like the long process of how we found this person. A lot of it is I already knew that this person was a great fit for the role and I wanted them. And easily three or four or five of the people are people that that I just hired immediately because I knew that they were perfect for the role. And the rest were pretty much strangers that we, we put out ads online or we interviewed them in neutral locations. And then like that's how we found... Commander Huey Bruno, who is in that clip you saw, who interviews Commander Vandre, we found him through a casting call. So he was somebody that none of us had known, but he showed up and performed very strongly with with the audition. And yeah, he was a great find. Well, let's move on to the next big aspect of your fan film. I consider there to be certain aspects of your fan film, the writing, the actors, the sets and the visual effects. So let's move on to the sets because you were one of the first fan films other than Star Trek New Voyage and Star Trek Continues. You were one of the first fan films to really build an elaborate set. And yours, you know, obviously had no precursor in the world of Star Trek yet. So how did that go? How did you design the set? How did you build the set? Who helped you build the set? Yeah, from the very beginning, I wanted to have a real practical set for several reasons. Firstly, it's good for the acting. It's good for knowing how to light things and where camera positions are. It makes certain things very easy. But at the same time, you have to build it, which I do have some construction experience in my litany of different things I've done in my past. And it was something I knew I was up to do. I just had never done a project that big before. So I kind of set about designing a set that I knew I could build personally because I didn't know who I could get help with. I didn't want to design something really elaborate and then be stuck finding somebody who was talented enough and generous enough to do it for free. So I designed something relatively simple, which is basically the bridge is an octagon. It's not circular and, and that fits into the more kind of primitive vibe that we wanted. So it's actually an octagon of... How many? One, two, three, four, five, seven identical? No, five or six. (laughs) I'm forgetting now. I think it's six identical consoles. And then two of the octagon faces were doors. One door going out into deck one and one door going out into the turbo lift. 
So that was a 360 degree set? Yep. Oh. Completely enclosed, except we didn't have any ceiling, which uh, in retrospect, I wish I built a ceiling because it's very difficult to add it in and post. And I think people can tell when you cut it out, though you don't really notice while you're watching TOS, for instance, where they didn't have a ceiling. So, you know, maybe it's not really a big deal. But uh, yeah, it's a 360 degree set. And the outside the doors are just partial sets. We didn't have any set beyond the doors. But yeah, it was something that was relatively easy to build because it was basically the bulk of the set was only two different types of pieces. We had consoles and we had corners. And the corners were, what is that, like 45 degrees or 22.5 degrees? I think 22.5 degrees or something like that where you just have to add in eight corners and then put the consoles in between them and your bridge is done. It's not like this extremely elaborate uh, engineering process. But at the same time, I wanted to make sure that we had kind of foolproof blueprints. And I was talking with Dean Newberry, who did the set construction for Star Trek Axanar, because I had done set design for Axanar. And I knew his name and I knew that he was really good because he was building really good sets for Axanar. And he couldn't come out and help build the set, unfortunately. I would have loved his help. But California and Pennsylvania are just way too far apart to collaborate on something like that. But he was very, very generous with basically drafting blueprints based on the designs I had done. So I sent him basic general proportions of what I wanted. And then he sent back like professional blueprints that were really, really helpful. So big shout out to him. And we use those blueprints. I had a few people in the area who also knew like carpentry and that kind of stuff. And we knocked that set out in I think like a month of weekends. It came together pretty fast. It was extremely repetitive because you had to build like eight of the same thing or six of the same thing. And they were not quick, you know. It would take three or four hours to assemble one. And then it's like, well, the next three or four hours is the same thing again. But I really think it paid off to have that 360 degree set that, you know, once the camera stops running, we've got it. You know, we don't have to do all this post-processing work to make it look real. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, it looks amazing even from the clips that I've seen. Now, was it a challenge to film within a completely enclosed set? Because you couldn't have the camera back too far for wide establishing shots, right? That's true. I mean, it kind of played into my entire mentality with the film, though, because I wanted it to be cramped and claustrophobic. And I was thinking back to particularly Apollo 13, the movie Apollo 13, where they filmed the scenes basically in a space as big as the spacecraft, that the actual Apollo 13 spacecraft, because they built that set inside an airplane that climbed and dove to give them zero G. And it's like, that's a multi-million dollar Hollywood movie. And they managed to shoot in this really tight space and make it look good. And I liked that feeling. Apollo 13 was a big inspiration on Pacific 201. You can kind of hear it in the naming structure of the movie. It kind of has a, you know, a similar feel about it. So it actually kind of played into the visual style of the film that it was actually kind of cramped and claustrophobic. But, um, we managed to get a few pretty good wide shots, but for the most part, the movie's actually shot very claustrophobically, and the set complements that. Well, cool. Now, Margaret, you said that you had a part in building the sets, so you were part of the construction team, or what else were you doing? Just, you know, hammering and nailing or anything else? Yeah, so I did some of the building, but uh, yeah, I coordinated a lot of it. It was, I think, February when we were building it, so it was pretty cold in that garage. But yeah, some days I was on set building with some of Eric's friends that he uh, hobbled together to work on it. Yeah, and, and actually I want to talk about the garage. You had a crisis at one point in that you had free storage space for the sets for a while, and then suddenly you didn't, and you had to do a crowdfunder just to sort of keep the sets from having to be either put into a dumpster or, or whatever would have happened with them. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, man. Yeah, that was kind of harrowing. Well, there's actually two crises that you're kind of conflating. <laughs> One is that before we built the sets, before we even built the sets, we were promised a space that was sufficient for the sets. But by the time we got around to building them, that space was no longer available to us. It was just kind of spontaneously sold by the owner. And we had not budgeted for 
paying rent. We were expecting to have a space for free. So we suddenly had this budget crisis where it's like, well, we don't have an extra. The place we found was like $450 a month, which was a fair price for the size of the place it was, but it was not in the budget and we needed it for like half a year. That was a huge chunk of change that we just didn't have. And we tried to make it work as long as possible. But once funds started getting short is when we actually started asking for additional funding, which people were very generous and very understanding, which I really appreciate. I was one of them. Thank you very much. After we finished shooting, I didn't want to demolish the sets because I knew I might want to do reshoots. And I was right about that. But I couldn't keep paying for the space that we were using. It was already outside our budget. So we actually got somebody, a friend of Casey Troyer, who plays Captain Demir, volunteered the back room of some retail space that he had where we could store our sets, which we did. And, you know, we paid for a moving van to move it all there. And we actually ended up never shooting reshoots with those sets because we lost that space as well. At which point we just had to get rid of the set. We just couldn't keep storing it because we didn't have money to store it and our spirits were broken with moving the set, which was a lot of work. Um, So we actually stored the set for several months after production with the intent of doing reshoots and we never did. So that was a little unfortunate and we did end up doing reshoots, but it's all green screen stuff. But we had photographic documentation of the set and stuff. If you can tell what shots aren't supposed to be there, you have a very good eye. (laughs) No, I'm sure you did really, really well. Which would have been a great transition into the next topic I wanted to cover, which was visual effects. However, I do need to ask you one question. So the sets are gone, which means that we're not necessarily going to be seeing a sequel to Pacific 201 because you don't have the sets anymore. You'd have to rebuild them. I do not anticipate any future installments in the Pacific 201 universe. I'm currently already in pre-production for my next project, and it is a completely original universe. And will we be seeing any more Star Trek fan films out of you in the Uh, future? I've got ideas for Star Trek fan films, ones that I think are very exciting, but not anytime soon. Maybe in a decade or so, I'll want to go back to doing a Star Trek fan film or something like that, but... After Pacific 201, I'm pretty eager to get to work on something that's completely my own. Yeah, you finished your five-year mission, and uh, (laughs) it's time to go on to other things, and I understand that. That's usually my last. I I always end with a, you know, what do we have to look forward to in the future? Now, that's not going to be the last thing we talk about, because uh, we've hit it now. But I do want to transition on to finally talking about the visual effects, because that's really your ballywick. I mean, you have been an amazing effects guy, not just... Pacific 201, but a lot of stuff I've seen you do online. But obviously, the USS Pacific was gorgeous, and you designed that yourself, right? That's correct, yeah. And you are like a total Trek geek. Uh, Yep. So anyway, can you talk a little bit about, one, the design process of the Pacific, as well as what you did to model it and to create your visual effects and, you know, all the CGI and then the green screen compositing. Pretty much just talk about everything. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll start with the ship. I've talked about the ship design at length. I don't want to recover ground that I've covered a lot in the past. But the long and short of it is I wanted a ship that was really grounded. I wanted something that really felt like Earth technology that wasn't you know, this this exotic sci-fi spaceship. I didn't want it to look like it was designed to look cool. I didn't want it to look um, like it was sculpted. I wanted it to look like it was made from modules and had equipment kind of crusted all over it because a big thrust behind the original Enterprise design was Matt Jeffries designed it so that it had no visible equipment on it because that was you know, in his mind, that made it look more futuristic. So a lot of what I do with Pacific 201 is what I call justifying the original series, because I think it's a great injustice to retcon the look of the original series. I much prefer, how can we make it so that what we see on screen in the original series, how do we make that actually look futuristic? 
it rather than like, well, that that's what the vision of the future looked like in the 60s. It's like, well, why can't it still be the vision of the future? Like we can justify why the view screen looks the way it does. We can justify why the buttons look the way they do, that sort of thing. And that was something that was kind of exciting to me with Pacific to, with the production design, retroactively make the original series look more futuristic than people remember, making the ship not have those organic lines. So there's almost no, besides the circular profile of the saucer and the nacelles, there's no organic curves the way that we see on the original Enterprise, for instance, the gentle slopes on the saucer, the undercut and stuff. There's none of that on the Pacific. It's all straight lines, hard engineering. You know, it's more primitive, you know. So in retrospect, the Enterprise looks like a futuristic spaceship and the Pacific looks like a primitive one. The Pacific is covered with sensors and scopes and all sorts of little doodads that aren't on the Enterprise because the Enterprise is a more futuristic ship. And at the same time, I could connect it to real world naval technology. So you'll see like radar domes and stuff like that on the Pacific, as well as real world space technology. For instance, I have International Space Station style radiators on the Pacific. Stuff like that helped me both justify the original series as well as link it to modern day technology. And you kind of get that instant continuity between us and Star Trek. Yeah, I definitely can see that. You know, for me, it's one of those things where I can't define good art, but I know what I like. And I looked at the Pacific and I just like, okay, this looks enough like Star Trek that I can believe it exists in the universe. And it looks different enough that I can see it being 50 or 60 years ahead of the Enterprise. I had that same feeling when I saw Axanar that the ship designs, because now thanks to J.J. Trek being quasi-canon, since the Kelvin had to exist before the timeline was shifted, that the Kelvin had a technology that now has to be assumed to be canon. And this was like, okay, well, this, this is the bridge, no pun intended, between what that crazy J.J. Abrams 2009 Star Trek Kelvin looked like and what the Enterprise looked like. And, you know, so Tobias's designs, you know, which are also John Eve's design, um, for Ax- for Prelude to Axanar, I mean, I just, I love those ships too. So, you know, once again, it's me totally falling in love with the gap timing of Star Trek. You know, I like those ships that fill in the gap. So you designed your starship, and then you went to create your visual effects. Now, are all the visual effects in Pacific 201 yours, or is there anything that other people worked on? I'll say it's like 95 to 5, uh, mine to other people. There are certain things that I just can't do. For instance, particle simulations and stuff like that. I'm a hard surface modeler, and that kind of stuff is completely lost on me. So I collaborated with a guy named Ryan Fletcher, who makes some really cool CGI Star Wars fan films on YouTube. Uh, I think it's his channel is called Skyforge. He's quite good at what he does. And I've worked with him on some YouTube videos on my YouTube channel. And uh, I noticed that he was starting to do uh, like explosion simulations and stuff in his Star Wars fan films. And I said, hey, do you think maybe you could do some particle simulations for Pacific 201? Since you're learning the process as we speak, maybe you can, you know, practice with my fan film. And he agreed to that and he gave me some great work. So I think two of the shots or, well, several of the shots include his particle simulations for the film. And I also worked with Angelos Carterinus, who I've also worked with extensively on my YouTube channel. He did some hard surface modeling that just kind of I didn't have time for. So, for instance, I needed some hull damage effects, and he modeled some really elaborate destruction effects that you get, like, the hull layer, then you've got, like, insulation, then you've got, like, wires and support struts. Like, he had this whole cross-section of the hull that he elaborately modeled, and it was really quite good. And we see that a lot in the film, though we don't get very close to it, but that's his work. But for the most part, I've done the vast majority of the visual effects. Now, how many man hours do you think has gone into, well, 
I'm going to say first into the visual effects. I'm going to ask a lot of things. I'm going to ask about production, post-production. But in terms of visual effects, there's, there's man hours and then there's render hours. So answer both of those questions. How many man hours and how many render hours do you think has gone into these beautiful shots that you've created? I really couldn't possibly begin to estimate. I think we estimated a few thousand man hours for the whole film, which it kind of simultaneously sounds like a lot and not a lot at the same time, because, you know, we've worked on this movie for five years, but we haven't worked every day for five years. Like we've got full-time jobs and families, you know, (laughs) so (laughs) it's mostly been a weekend project at that for five years. And then for the past or for four years. And then like the past year, it's been basically a full-time job for a a smaller number of people. So I would say three thousand man hours i don't know <laughs> it's, it's it's hard to say i mean it's anybody's guess but it, it's been a lot it's basically been a full-time job for me the past year and it's been about 12 hours a day seven days a week for the past month wow <laughs> what do you do for the rest of your life there uh eric <laughs> uh, n- nothing really i, I mean <laughs> I happen to be in a, a situation where I can kind of manage that, though I'm going to be glad to get part one out this week so that I can take a little bit of a break and catch up on a lot of my work. I have deadlines to reach. I don't necessarily have to work every day doing what I do, but you know, I'll reach a deadline and I need to do it. So I've got a few deadlines that are kind of all I've pushed off until after I finish part one, and then I'm going to have a huge week of just blasting through a bunch of backlog and then i'm gonna jump into finishing part two (laughs) (laughs) which is interesting by the way because you know when i started this interview once again i haven't seen it yet i didn't know you were only releasing part one so that is actually going to give me an interesting question to kind of end this on which is when's part two gonna be out (laughs) that's to be determined i don't want to say anything too hard but it's not going to be super soon but also not super far out The time between part one and part two can be measured in weeks. Let's just say that. It's not months, it's not years, weeks. Okay. So we're not going to be waiting another five years. That's correct. I mean, part part two is almost like we were considering getting both part one and part two done this Friday, but we wanted a little bit of extra time to really perfect part two because there's some sequences in there that need a lot of love and care. There's a big simulation that I want to do for part two that still hasn't been done. And I'd rather not rush it. To me, it's much more important that the final product reflects the time and dedication and passion that went into it than getting it out in a reasonable amount of time, which I guess is why it's taken five years. Like we probably could have finished the movie much sooner, but it would not be remotely as good as it's going to be. Yeah, I mean, I know that you shut down production and and or post-production for a while, but there's a lot of fans out there. They look at you and they look at Axanar and a number of the other ones and First Frontier and Yorktown. I mean, so many different fan films have taken more time than the impatient fans wanted to wait. And you've been involved. You were involved with Prelude to Axanar. Are you involved with with Axanar at all as well? Um, just with a, a little tiny bit, but I've been working on my own stuff. You know, since then, I was also involved with Star Trek Horizon by Tommy Kraft. Well, that one actually went fairly quickly, all things kind of, <laughs> especially since it's like a two hour movie. Yeah, I'm not I, sure yeah. exactly how he did that. I was kind of inspired by him, actually, because I was like, oh, like one guy can make a movie. And I guess he's literally just, in his parents' basement. Yeah, I guess he's just superhuman or something because he did that somehow. Well, he didn't come out of that basement. I, I, I think he didn't come out of that basement for like seven straight months. Yeah, <laughs> just chained himself yeah. to the desk. Yeah, I mean, Star Trek Horizon was amazing. But for those people out there who look at the timeline of Pacific 201 and the timeline of Axanar and, let's say, Farragut's Homecoming and Romulan War and Yorktown and all the rest that have, you know, taken a long time and they go like, you know, it's just a fan film. Why don't you just finish it already? What do you say to them? Or do you just ignore them? (laughs) I mean, I listen to everyone's comments. For the most part, people have been extremely understanding, way more than I would ever expect them to be. I'll make an announcement about a delay, and I'm 
fearing the worst and like, man, they're going to abandon me. They're going to feel betrayed. They're going to want their money back. And 99% of the feedback is, look, we understand. We want the movie to be as good as possible. We're willing to wait. And that's really the consensus. There's a few people that seem a little more impatient. And in that light, I mean, not expecting such a gracious response, I completely understand. Like, if there's a few people that are upset. I was expecting people to be upset. I'm upset. So, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for people who are impatient. But at the same time, I would hope that they could understand, at least at some level, maybe they're publicly upset, but I would hope that they know, like, we're all volunteers who are doing this because we love the project, because we love the universe, and we can't dedicate our lives to it. We're already making an incredible sacrifice of time and energy and money. You know, it's going to take a long time. (laughs) And (laughs) if we want it to reflect the effort we put into it, it's going to take even longer. Because, yeah, we could easily just turn it around quickly, but then we would have spent thousands of hours on something that wasn't good. So you kind of have to draw the line somewhere, obviously. Otherwise, you'd work on it forever. But I think we've struck a good balance between investment of time and what we got out of it. And I hope people agree that it was worth the wait. Well, I certainly think it's going to be worth the wait. And granted, everybody else has seen it by now. So I just (laughs) have to say, I'm going to watch it as soon as it comes out. So Margaret, one last word from you before we wrap up here. You are sitting there. When I called Eric to have this interview, you were there working with him last minute. I mean, it's two days before you go live. And in fact, Margaret was going to just head out and let me interview Eric. And I said, if Margaret's a producer and part of this, if she wants to be part of the interview, that would be great. So I'm happy to have had you uh, around, Margaret. So at this point, what has, if you wanted to sort of sum up, what has your production experience been like working on this five-year project? I mean, is this something where you feel like, oh, thank God it's finally done? Do you feel like, oh, I wish we could have had a little bit more time to get it right? I'm guessing you're proud of the work you've done, but, you know, what is your sort of summary feeling in a couple of days before you uh, release this? I think mostly I'm amazed at how great it is. I only got on board with the project because I know how incredibly talented Eric is. You know, there's always ups and downs in the project, and sometimes you feel like, oh, no, things aren't going well, and... And then you see a clip or something that Eric's put together and you're like, oh man, this is going to be great. And it, you know, it kind of can go up and down, but we just watched last night the not quite final cut of the first part. And we were here with a couple friends and we just kind of broke into spontaneous applause because it was like, wow, good job, Eric. So it's been really amazing to work with such great people. So yeah, some ups and downs, but I'd say overall, it's just been a really great experience. And, you know, I'm not a professional, but I feel like I've gained a lot of really great experience through the whole process. So what are you guys working on here at the very last minute? What still needs to be done? You know, just minor tweaks at this point. You know, we watch through like, oh, there's the boom pole. Better like fix that a little bit or... uh you know, oh, this sound leveling is maybe could be tweaked a bit. So not anything major as we'd probably be in trouble if there were major things, but just minor tweaking, making sure everything is perfect. I'm so glad that Pacific 201 is quote unquote finally finished. As I said, it's going to be finally finished by the time this interview airs. I do thank you both for your time, not only for this interview, but your time for the last five years making this gift to fans. So Thank you and congratulations to both of you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.